Today's video is about the male and female reproductive systems. So I'm just going to talk you mainly through the anatomy and I'm going to attach some questions at the end so you can see what sorts of questions they'll ask. However, make sure you've got the diagrams of each straight in your mind and for me the easiest one is the female one so I'm going to start there. So you've got a couple of ovaries, remember that they produce eggs and that they're also responsible for manufacturing that hormone called oestrogen. Remember that oestrogen first of all builds up the lining of the uterus, secondly it inhibits the production of FSH and thirdly it causes the secondary sexual characteristics that you see in females such as hip widening, uh, menstruation, pubic hair growing etc etc. So it's a very important hormone. If you want to hear more about its role you need to look at my video on the menstrual cycle because that will add a lot more. However, the the ovaries connect to the uterus through tubes and those tubes are either called fallopian tubes or the oviduct depending on what you want to call them and it's in the oviduct that fertilisation occurs and that's when the sperm hits the egg so the two gametes combine and that is fertilisation and that occurs in the entrance of the oviduct. At that point of fertilisation a zygote is formed and that's the first cell that's made and it implants itself in the wall of the uterus and it will undergo divisions by mitosis in order to create an embryo which will then develop into the fetus and later you'll have a baby which you'll give birth to. So that's where the baby plugs into, into the wall of the uterus. However, when the woman gives birth, what happens then is the cervix will open and the baby will have to pass down the vagina and out it will be in the real world. Welcome to the world, baby. So I think that was everything I wanted to say about the female reproductive system. Let's look at the male one now, slightly more complicated. So you've got a common tube this time, and that is called the urethra, and it passes along the shaft of the penis. And what that does is it allows semen and urine out of the body, and connected to the urine you will see the bladder, which is obviously where urine is stored after it's been produced by the kidney. So the urine passes out of the body via the urethra. You've got several other glands and things, things like the prostate gland, um, seminal vesicles and what they do is they add fluid to the semen then you need to actually produce the semen and the main part of the semen is the sperm and remember it's the testicles, testicles which will make the sperm and the testicles sit in a sac of skin called the scrotum the reason why they sit in that scrotum rather than being more internally found is because the testicles need to be at a lower temperature in order to develop the sperm properly and so that's why the testicles effectively hang outside of the body so that they can produce the sperm and it can mature properly. Now that sperm, once it's made, will pass along that sperm duct, or you can call it the vas deferens, then it will meet the urethra where it will pass out of the head of the penis into the vagina and then if the baby, if the mother, the woman, has an egg released at the same time and all the conditions are right, then a baby will develop and it will be born nine months later. It's quite a hard topic to explain, I hope I managed to find some diagrams to help you with this. Don't forget that the testicles also produce testosterone, which is a hormone responsible for um, the secondary male characteristics, such as voice deepening, so the breaking of a voice, pubic hair growth, broadening shoulders, um, that sort of thing in guys, so be aware of those roles. And I'm going to attach some questions now, I hope you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and I'll be back soon with another one. See you soon! Question 10. The diagram shows the male reproductive organs. Name the structures labelled A, B and C. So let's look at A. It's leading along the penis to the bladder and that is the urethra. Remember that carries semen and urine. B. Let's have a look. It's the tube connecting the testicles to pretty much everything else and we call that tube either the sperm duct or the seminal duct or you can call it the vas deferens if you're feeling particularly fancy. C. Okay, I've already actually mentioned what that is. That's a testicle or a testes. B. A couple want to control their fertility. The man has an operation to cut tube B. Sounds painful. Explain how this operation would prevent his partner from being pregnant. Right, well, if we cut tube B, we can see automatically that the, there's no connection anymore between the testicle and everything else. So effectively, the sperm can't enter the penis and no fertilisation can ever occur. C. The woman could also have an operation to cut her oviducts to prevent pregnancy. Remember, the oviducts connect the ovaries to the uterus. Suggest why the operation to cut tube B in males is more common than that to cut the oviducts in females. So the reason is, is because in tube B in the males, it's only sitting in the scrotum, so it's far less invasive than trying to tie off the oviducts, which obviously sit far more in the interior of a woman. And so you can say, first of all, for the first mark, that the testes are effectively outside, whereas the ovaries are inside. 
Therefore, in the testes operation, you can use local anaesthetic, so it's not a major procedure, whereas for a woman, she'd have to have a general anaesthetic. And apparently, it's easier to reverse the operation if you use the snipping of the sperm duct compared with snipping of the oviduct. Structure C produces a hormone. Name this hormone. Describe its functions. Where's structure C gone? Okay, that's the testicles. So the hormone it's produced sounds like testicles, so it's testosterone. And the various things it does, well, it leads to sperm development. It leads to secondary sexual characteristics developing. So that's in puberty, like men's voices getting deeper, having um, bigger muscles, broad shoulders, that sort of thing. And it also develops men's sex drive. The diagrams show the female and male reproductive systems. The table lists some events that take place in the female reproductive system, some that take place in the male reproductive system, and some that take place in both. Complete the table by giving the lateral letters to indicate which, where each event takes place. The first one has been done for you. Right, fertilisation occurs in P, which is the overduct. Yes, I agree with that. Release of oestrogen. Well, that's um, obviously to do with females, and it comes from the ovary. So you're going to have to put the letter Q there because that's identifying the ovaries. Meiosis. Okay, meiosis is a type of cell division which creates sex cells, so both sperm and eggs. So you're looking for the ovary in the female and the testicles in the male. So that's letters Q and V, respectively. Next up, repair of the uterus lining. Right, okay, that has to happen in the uterus. So R is the uterus. Implantation of an embryo. That also occurs in the uterus, so it needs to be R again. Formation of gametes. Well, gametes are sex cells, so we're looking for the ovary and the testicles again. So that's Q and V again. Eight. The passage describes cell division and reproduction in humans. Complete the passage by writing a suitable word or words in each of the spaces. Fully grown adults can produce sex cells or gametes, as they're otherwise known, called sperm and eggs. The sperm cells are much smaller than the egg cells and have powerful tails to enable them to swim. The cell division used to make sex cells is called meiosis and in males this takes place in the testes or the testicles. The sperm cells pass along out of the male along a tube called the urethra and into the female's body, then through the cervix and into the oviduct in which fertilisation takes place. If you don't want to say oviduct, you could say fallopian tube there. Okay, this question is dipping into um, reproduction in flowers. I've got another video on that in case you want to check it out, but I didn't want to just miss out part A for the sake of it. So, the diagram shows an insect pollinated flower called a lily. Describe the features of an insect pollinated flower that help it to attract insects. First up, it has a nectary, and that's what um, is full of sugar. And that's the whole reason why insects visit these flowers in the first place. It's not because they feel like being helpful and carrying pollen around. It's literally because they're hungry and they want the sugar. So first mark, the lily has a nectary. And then the second mark is how the insect actually spots the flower. And it's because it has large petals. And for the third mark, you could say that these petals are very colourful. And there's a fourth available mark if you specify that they have a strong scent. Anyway, moving on to something more relevant, sexual reproduction in flowering plants and mammals involves the process of gamete formation by meiosis followed by fertilisation. Use the words from the box to complete the table about sexual reproduction in flowering plants and mammals. Each word can be used once, more than once, or not at all. Right, female gametes are made in the, and in the flowering plants we're looking at for the word ovule, and in mammals these are obviously produced in the ovary. Male gametes are made in the anther in the flowering plants, whereas in mammals they're made in the testes. Gametes are brought together by pollination in flowering plants, whereas it's copulation, which is the process of having sex, in mammals. Fertilisation takes place in the ovule in flowering plants, whereas in mammals it's inside the fallopian tube, which is also known as the oviduct, remember that for me. And lastly, embryo develops in the seed in flowering plants, whereas in mammals we know that the embryo and the baby therefore develops in the uterus, which we also sometimes call the womb. Cell division in an organism can take place by mitosis or my meiosis. Give three ways in which mitosis differs from meiosis. Okay, so the first obvious thing is that mitosis is used in growth, whereas meiosis is used in sexual reproduction. Second point is that mitosis produces clones, whereas meiosis produces um, variation, so genetic variation. And third point, mitosis only involves one round of cell division, whereas meiosis involves two rounds. You could also, if you wanted to, say that the chromosome number stays the same in mitosis, whereas it halves in meiosis.